communism was just a red herring. The van, the food, gas, hotel, uh, four guys, 3,000 miles, five nights. At this point, you do it for love. After a certain age, it's hard to make friends. And I've known Joe since I was 13. It, it'll be my responsibility again to take care of everybody on the tour. I mean, we've been through shit, and we've been through hell and back, and we know what it's like. We still survived. You're like, this is the band, this is a gang. And if Billy's into it, and if John and Piper are around, I'll be doing it. And if they're interested, they'll be doing it with me. And if not, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Drinking, smoking. Uh, I have a CBD joint in one hand and a Pabst Blue Ribbon in the other. The, the words "random drug test" and their fucking company guidelines got me a little bit spooked. So I've been trying to like uh, stay as clean as possible. I guess. I mean, plain it even safe. says, yeah, it even says in there like if you live in a state where it's legal, we can still fucking fire you for it. Catch every lawyer's right or whatever that fire at will. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure it probably does fuck with their like that might not be entirely a decision that they had to make. Like that might be the insurance companies fucking bugging them because they carry like, you know, millions of dollars worth of fucking liability insurance and get government contracts and all kinds of shit where I'm sure they're like, we got to have all these people fucking drug tested. I was like, uh, you pay me just barely enough and have just barely good enough benefits to make me quit fucking smoking weed. <laughs> I haven't tried it out yet, but with my last uh, vaporizer I bought, I got a free canister of CBD stuff. It's, it was one of those right. vapes that takes uh, dry flour or cartridges. Ah. Yeah. So, because I haven't exactly figured out the whole cartridges thing, so I wanted to keep my options open. And they're like, hey, they're, fu yeah. they're fucking spendy, and they're like all made in China. So, or like at least the cartridge part is. And then I think like at least in Colorado they buy the fucking cartridges from China and then fill them in Colorado. So, uh, yeah, real hit, real hit or miss in Colorado, and they're all really fucking expensive too. But it is a nice low key way to fucking like you know smoke in public if you're going to a concert or something. Yeah, used to do that at work. They don't do that with kitchen jobs or else they'd fire everybody. <laughs> All right. Most of my jobs have been restaurant adjacent, if not in a restaurant. They don't give a fuck if the people in the kitchen are smoking weed. They just want them to fucking show up to work. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, when I was at OSU, there's no way they were going to do random drug testings in the folklore department. <laughs> <laughs> fuck no. They don't have any employees. Yeah, right. Like one person. Uh, I forget her name. It's been a minute. We have you and I have not skyped. Skyped. We obviously talked on the summer series more recently. Right. This says five months. Is that true? Uh, that's possible. I was trying to remember what the hell was the last episode that I was on. It was either. I don't think it was the crazies because that was like a fucking year ago. That is one kind of nice thing about the CBD shit. I, I just buy the flour because I can get uh, like 
two ounces of fucking shake for like 50 bucks at my fucking place right here in town in Wyoming. And so it's got me real into uh, like rolling big fat fucking joints now because that's about what it takes to get like half a buzz off one of these things. I, I kind of compared it to when I take shrooms. Got to take so many. Well, of course, I don't know a lot about them. So it'd just be whatever I got my hands on that I was usually more into the acid. So it'd be like, I, I, I'm not feeling anything. Or uh, did you ever take herbal ecstasy? That was, uh, that was a rip off. I think so. Herbal ecstasy, huh? They used to sell it in porn shops. I remember trying it in high school because a bunch of people I know turned into raver kids. And uh. I, I hated party drugs like that. So I was like, well, I'll try this. It'll be more mellow. I was like, no, it's just a waste of money. <laughs> I wonder what it was. Just like oregano or something. Something. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it was something. It was, it was something dumb. That's for sure. I'm sure Alex Jones made a pretty penny. Here. Right. Porn stores and head shops seem like they can get away with selling a lot of shit that is like not very closely. I mean, I know a lot of them got in trouble like when Spice was a big fucking deal, but like, uh, I don't know. I've known people that worked in like head shops and fucking porn shops in the States and in like Australia. And uh, it sounds like for the most part, that as long as they don't call it like they're like, you know, you got to call it something else, basically. Like you can't be like, hey, you want to buy some fucking fake cocaine or something? Then then you're going to get in trouble if you're like selling it to a narc or whatever. But. Uh, yeah, one of my, one of her friend's wife was from Australia. She worked at a head shop. She said the cops used to come in and try and buy stuff, and like they'd have to, you know, they're trying they're trying to get you for selling something that's, you know, well, like I said, basically just like they they would have to fucking call it something else, and because uh, yeah, if you just walked into a head shop, and I, like, I want to buy some fucking weed. They'd be like, okay, well, we don't do that here because it's super fucking illegal, but we do sell some, you know, fucking. You know, herbal blends or whatever that you can fucking smoke or, you know, can't be like, I want to buy some bath salts. Anywho, I never tried it a lot of the fucking, uh, like, our, our porn store is pretty fucking seedy. Like, I mean, they're, 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 I'm sure I've been in there to do the fire extinguishers and shit and they're perfectly nice people. But like up until I was a certain age, that was like a place to avoid kind of. Gotcha. And also the town like is consistently trying to run them out of fucking town for decades and decades now even though like spencer's up at the mall like you know they don't fucking sell porn or whatever but they got like a whole fucking section of dildos and shit that you can go buy so i don't really see the problem oh shit i don't think i ever noticed them selling that at uh spencer's but i think the last time i was in a mall except for when i was going through it to get to a movie theater which right. even then I don't really like going to the theaters at the mall because you have to go to the mall. It was seriously back in the arcade days. There's a pretty cool porn store down past campus here called The Garden. Either either totally worker owned or, you know, independently owned. And there used to be the chamber and the garden. And you could guess what was at the chamber. Right. And then it sort of just became one thing but they've been like pretty cool and they've been really active with like women have options uh carrying like you know like plan b and give it sunscreen and first aid to protesters all summer during the blm protests downtown and ah. cool people that's nice of them yeah but yeah i mean i'm sure there's a lion's den in just about every state <laughs> at least one or two somewhere on the highway which was where you got the the good bad fake drugs is, it, is that like an actual chain or is that a euphemism no the lion's den i guess it's not everywhere but i've seen them in multiple states uh on tour oh i said the secret word that was when i should introduce what we're going to talk about and then we'll continue with our conversation Welcome to another psychosemantic podcast. <laughs> I love how you sneak those in there. <laughs> you got to take the segues when they come. As you heard that voice over there, that is returning champion Mark Ball. Well, hello, weirdos in the psychosemantic 
uh, audience, uh, Dar- Darren's show is n- maybe not the only show that I would be willing to openly talk about drug use on, but uh, it's it's definitely my favorite. <laughs> and I could have cut out all of that other stuff, and ah, people, fuck it, leave it in. Don't know what you're talking about, but they know. And we talked a little bit about drugs last time we were here talking about idle hands. In That's April. it. Yep. We were trying to remember. I don't know if you're recording that, but yeah, we were trying to remember what the fuck was the last one I was on. It was the 420 show for idle hands where we talked about weed and the fucking connection was horrendous. So it was a very <laughs> weird show to do, kind of. I think I was really drunk for that, too. Yeah, you were. Well, you you didn't seem so much, but then afterwards you told me that you were very drunk. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I started drinking whiskey like the minute I got fucking home and then we like started recording two hours and talking about weed being illegal and and Devin Sawa horror movies from 1999 just makes me want to fucking hammer a lot of whiskey, apparently. Yeah, you know, you gotta tell me about the devil. But uh, lesser <laughs> lesser known bands than the offspring. <laughs> we are here to talk about. The 1996 Canadian mockumentary called Hardcore Logo, directed by Bruce McDonald, who did things, uh, among other things, Pontypool. I didn't realize until this time around paying attention. I fucking love Pontypool so goddamn much. That is like absolutely like a broadcasting and like audiophile geeks fucking... Uh, wet dream of a fucking weirdo horror movie. Like it's it's such a fucking. There's literally no other movie I can think of. It's like Pawnee Pool. It's kind of like a million other little things, but it's not really like those things. It's kind of hard to describe. It's one of those movies you really just need to sit down and check out. Uh, I I, I, I Pawnee Pool is definitely way more well known than Hardcore Logo is. I'd say. I think you're like one of. I don't know, five fucking people I know that have seen this movie. I asked about before before I came to you and like uh, said, hey, we should do fucking hardcore logo. I, I actually sent a message to Doug Tilly of uh, Eric Roberts is the fucking man fame and asked him if he had ever done a podcast about hardcore logo. And he said no. But he also said that this is in like his fucking top 10 favorite movies. So uh, and, and definitely way high on his list of his favorite Canadian movies. Uh, I I, I kind of knew that Doug was a big Bruce McDonald fan based on stuff I'd heard him say on other podcasts and stuff. And, you know, to be fair, he's a Canadian. So I'm just like, surely Doug has done this on a show at some point. He's done five billion fucking podcasts. And nope, we beat him to the punch, evidently. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I hope if you're listening, you are not disappointed. We, But you already know that we are not thorough and well thought out. And intellectual, like uh, your your analyses, your analyses tend to be, Doug. We uh, we just see what comes out. Not saying that we don't say intellectual shit, but we call it intellectual shit. See, I'm rambling. <laughs> it's already Doug's happening. Kind of a, I I would still definitely love to hear Doug's you know, extended thoughts on hardcore logo. Cause this is, there's a little, kind of a lot to unpack in this movie and I, we're definitely not going to get to all of it. Like in one show, I mean, I, just, I feel like this is a kind of movie I could talk about all fucking day, but uh, we're, inevitably we're going to get into this and be like, you know, uh, we're going to go off on 10,000 fucking little tangents about everything except for the movie. And uh, hopefully we hit some like, you know, main points about this thing kind of because I fucking love this movie. But also that's just not really how I roll, especially when I come over on this show. This is, this is a little bit more laid back and a little bit more, you know, just having a good conversation with my good friend Darren kind of deal. So I had not seen this in some time, man. I'm pretty sure the first time. Well, I'm definitely sure the first time I watched it. I had already been on tour and I had already been on a, I mean, lots of tours have shitty parts, but I feel like the, I I was in the era of things like what happens in this movie, except for all the, is it, uh, Billy, Billy talent? Yeah. Nothing like Billy talent, but... Lots of other things. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. if we, I mean, you could summarize the movie really quick, but I think we'll just sort of go through it and see where the tangent takes us. So 
It's ni- It's a 1996, uh, 1996 Canadian mockumentary about a punk band called Hardcore Logo in Canada, West Coast Canada, uh, to be specific. And well, the West is the best, as he says at some point. And by he, I mean Joe Dick, who is sort of our, our protagonist. He's the uh, singer, songwriter. He play, does he play guitar? Or does he play bass? I forget. I think he plays guitar because, yeah, the other dude that eventually starts a country band is the bass player. But yeah, uh, yeah. Oxenberger, right? Was yeah, John. Yeah, John Oxenberger on bass. Uh, Billy Talents, lead guitarist, and uh, Pipe Fitter is their drummer. Uh, they, they're, they're all kind of, yeah, this the movie kind of just follows these characters, but definitely Joe, Joe Dick is our main character. I, my experience, so to go a little a quick, little background, I was never really actually in any bands. I am like a little bit musically inclined and I've tried writing music like by myself a little bit. And there was a very short period where I was at least like doing band practices with a band, like where I was on keyboard. It was, uh, ill advised basically, uh, being a fucking uh, in in a synths and keyboards and shit and trying to join a band unless that's going to be like the main focus like don't try and jam fucking synthesizers into genres of music that absolutely do not fit it uh but i used to hang out with like all of the fucking punk rock kids like i was like humongous into fucking punk music and like skate culture and fucking stoner culture and counter culture in general so i used to hang out with a lot of dudes like fucking joe dick that like just thought they were punk as fuck and like, really, they were, you know, largely selfish and like, I don't know, just uh, damaged in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, which is kind of, you know, it's 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 endearing and aggravating at the same time, hanging out with people like this and calling them calling them your friends. And uh, but yeah, Hardcore Logo brought back a lot of memories. I also hadn't seen this in a really long time. I got a copy of this on VHS when I was about 19 or 20 from a friend of mine who was not really a punk, but was like in a punk music kind of. And it was also just a gigantic fucking movie geek and like turned me on to like quite a bit of good stuff. But yeah, I had a VHS of this. It was on the Rolling Thunder label that I Tarantino and I'm pretty sure Roger Avery like had a whole uh, video label that put out uh, VHS and like the early early days of DVD and this was one of them I think I think this this has got to be the only movie that's like this in their label I, I've never really looked up all the rest of their stuff but I would assume probably a lot of it's like uh, martial arts and action movies kind of uh, Hardcore Logo is a pretty fucking unique beast I would say oh yeah totally I almost got turned around when you said Joe Dick because I remembered uh, doesn't Joey Shithead show up somewhere in the movie I know Joey Ramone does. Right. You know, there's like some real punks. And that kind of adds to uh, uh, Chip, uh, me chiming in on the first time I saw it. I had just come home from the bar and I was living with my guitar player and he was in our apartment watching it with a couple of the other guys from the scene. Right. That would hang out at our spot. I came in a little bit after it had started, and they told me it was a documentary. (laughs) This is totes real, dude. And I was just watching it and watching it and watching it. And uh, at the end, which I, I think we might leave that out because I feel like... Everybody that's seen it knows exactly what I'm talking about, and people who haven't, it's kind of a spoil. Yeah, we can kind of tiptoe around it, because, yeah, I do I do want to encourage people to go out and see this. You can get that steel book for, like, 13 bucks, and so, yeah, I, yeah, we, we, can, we can do that. We don't want to spoil the fucking ending. Uh, but when that happened, I was like, holy fucking shit! And they all had a really good time watching me overreact for a minute, and then I, you know, sort of, wait a second. You're like, why is nobody else as horrified as I am right now? Yeah, why are you just watching me? It, it was it was after the whole show somebody somebody getting murdered on the internet sort of thing was new, so ah. it it wasn't like that. So I, through my foggy mind, I pieced it together, and either way, I thought it was. I thought it was an amazing documentary that caused something that had never happened before. <laughs> and then when I went back to it, just as a 
mockumentary. That's my favorite kind of found footage because it easily explains why. I guess I don't know why they keep filming it. like yeah. like the and and the fact that like the the crew and the director are sort of like off camera characters in the whole thing. Like they acknowledge them all the time and say, "Hey, you fuck you, cameraman." Like the part where pipe fitter is reading their bass player's journal out loud and being a dick uh sort of near the end of the tour that's uh okay okay so if you've never seen hardcore logo the setup is joe dick is the singer slash guitar player for in the movie universe uh legendary underground canadian punk band hardcore logo he says that something hate was it was uh 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 fuck what was his name the bucky hate bucky hate he says bucky hate was robbed and you know how rumors spread through a music scene especially hey uh, to uh, he just says the bucky hate who was sort of like the godfather of their scene had been uh and they, uh, bucky is played by julian richings which is one of the now I would have recognized him and had known that it wasn't a documentary. Oh, yeah. He's in fucking everything. And the guy that plays Billy Talent. Uh, I don't know if you ever watched Californication. Oh, is he the other guy that's not Brad Pitt in that movie? Oh, oh, the the show. The oh, David, the show. The David Duchovny show. Okay, no, I have not, I have not watched that show. The guy that plays Billy Talent plays an older sort of legendary guitar guy in LA that mostly just produces records and shit. Now that the David Duchovny character right. hooks up with to help him write, uh, his autobiography. Um, but I think that's the only thing I saw him in, but he looks almost exactly the same except for, you know, 10, 20 years older. Right. Same hair. It's got the guitars and shit. Uh, acts a little bit more like the band members that aren't uh, Billy Talent <laughs> in the show. He's a little bit more like uh, Joe plus Bucky Hate, I think. A- anyway, right. I guess I, sometimes I bring it up as one of the best roles that I think Sherry Moon Zombie played. Uh, she plays a nurse on screen for like five minutes telling David Duchovny he's got a nice cock after he gets a vasectomy. And that's like, huh. I believe her more in that scene than I do in a lot of stuff. So, uh, that's fair. Anyway, <laughs> tangent two aside, they throw a benefit concert to raise money for Bucky Hates, Missing Legs. And uh, what? Flash Bastard. Um, Lick the Pole. DOA shows up. Is, is that who Joey Shithead is, uh, is in? Is DOA? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. They, they play the benefit show also. And stuff. So they, they raise some money. And then there's the side story that Billy Talent, the good guitar, the lead guitar player in the band... Uh, is working with a more established band down in California. <laughs> I don't know why it makes me laugh when I think of the, the the band that he's you know basically cheating on hardcore logo with to go make the big bucks is called Jennifer, and on the they show like the album cover at some point and it's all lowercase and like I'm pretty sure it's spelled with like a ph in the middle of it instead of an f and, and it just. And a U, and it just looks like a fucking like <laughs> it looks like a like early '90s like Bush album cover or something. It's just like the ugliest fucking thing, and like I don't, I don't know why that just cracks me up. And it's like it's kind of perfect because like you know like he the dude just wants to fucking play guitar, and like it's definitely not really worked out good in the past with hard hardcore logo. And there's definitely like, you know, he wants to make a living at it. So like these, there's the commercial success of this other band, Jennifer. And it's just, I don't know why it's just fucking <laughs> just thinking about that album cover cracks me up, but uh, please continue. Well, and you know, he and Joe Dick are best buds. They grew up together. They started their first band together. Something that most bands have is, you know, two people that, 
grew up together, it seems, at least a lot of first bands. Yep. You know, I mean, I started my first band and a band that'll pretty much whenever I tell a tour story, it'll be this band with my best bud who lived two houses away when I was born. Right. And we just tore the neighborhood up. And then when we got into punk, it was like, okay, your dad plays guitar. Or it was his idea, I think. He said, my dad plays guitar. I'm going to get a guitar. Your dad plays the bass. You should play the bass. We'll find somebody to play the drums. And then eventually I was like, I like playing the drums most. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can play guitar and bass uh, on uh, rock band a lot better than I can in real life. <laughs> Uh, same here. I'm not much of a guitar player. I'm fucking rubbish at fucking drums too. Like I have no fucking rhythm whatsoever. So, uh, my, my best bet is understanding how to program weird technology and make weird noises with it and kind of more, uh, express myself that way rather than ever really being taught traditional, you know, uh, music type shit. So, uh, yeah, but no, I, I hear what you're saying too, because the band that I used to hang out with, a lot like in my late teens and pretty much all throughout my twenties was uh, uh, two brothers, one that played guitar and one that played drums. And yeah, they, they had, you know, they, they grew up on the same shit. They had real similar taste. They had like kind of shorthand ways of referring to things like, you know, when they're talking about music and writing it and shit. Uh, and I think that helps. And yeah, I just never really, uh, we, we, we tried for a little bit. I don't know if they were just humoring me. I mean, we had some pretty, okay, like the practices were fun. I don't know if the music was fucking good when I <laughs> played a little bit for them, but uh, mostly we were just having fun at that point. But uh, yeah, anywho. It's what it's all fuck about. You see what happens when you think about the business end. Uh-huh. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't end well for one or two of these dudes. Right? So... It doesn't end well. I mean, the whole thing doesn't end well for lots of people, but specifically wow. the music end of it. Yeah. So as people do, I don't know, did you, did you ever uh, hang out with them long enough to go on tour or anything? Not really. We played a lot of local shows and like would occasionally go out of town to do uh, you know, shows outside of town, but never, never really got to like the full touring kind of deal we did lots and lots and lots of fucking local shows and a lot of the time i would like run the fucking you know the merch booth or like i do like this is the early a lot of this was the early days of social media shit like when facebook barely fucking existed or like you know uh even going all the way back to like the myspace days kind of uh so sometimes i would do a little bit of that kind of stuff like promoting them or whatever and you know uh just doing a little bit of damage control when they would get a little out of control at fucking shows uh but yeah no, never like full-blown tours I, we also all grew up in wyoming where like it's not gonna be super easy like so sometimes the next nearest town in wyoming is a hundred miles or you know hundreds of miles away kind of deal so um yeah i don't know i i, I do know of at least a couple other wyoming bands that can do you know can sustain that kind of full tour like uh system restore is one that's got a few friends of my or at least one or two of my friends uh that uh is you know sometimes get gigs playing with other punk bands and can do like a pretty you know quick and easy kind of summer tour through colorado and montana and the surrounding states and kind of stuff uh the other two that are like a little bit more bigger of a bigger deal are the lillingtons and teenage bottle rocket which oh, yeah. all those those dudes are like about I don't know, somewhere between five and ten years older than me, obviously. But like a lot of my fucking like older punk friends knew those dudes and uh, either went to like, you know, high school or fucking whatever. They, they grew up in Laramie, Wyoming, which is where the University of Wyoming is. And that's about two and a half hours away from here. But I, I wish I could find my stash of old show flyers from like the fucking Casper, Wyoming scene, because a lot of those are uh like yeah especially the ones that have teenage bottle rocket on it that would crack me up knowing like oh fuck they're putting out records on fucking fat records now and are kind of a big deal so uh but yeah anyway the, the, the band that i hung around mostly was like uh uh they were basically a punk band with an upright bass everybody was big into psycho billy at that time for whatever reason uh but the music was still basically kind of punk rock with a little bit of kind of a billy fucking 
kind of deal to it. They also like never, we worked for like maybe uh, two years or something trying to get a like recorded in their fucking basement kind of album done. Uh, at one point they paid some dickhead that like, I think basically ran off with their money for the most part to record an album down in Denver. And I, uh, th- those tracks never saw the light of day. So I can't even like point, point people in the right direction to like find this band. Like it, all the recordings of it are fucking terrible. I've got a terrible quality anyway. Uh, also I don't want to really like incriminate a bunch of them and any of the stories we're going to be telling. So we'll just leave the band that I used to hang out with nameless. If you're free, if you know me and you're, you know, listening to this and are aware of, you know, things you, you could probably fucking figure it out, but, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll save that for a different day. Maybe if you know, you know, if you know, you know, I think, uh, from Columbus, probably the more famous, you know, the new bomb Turks are from here. Okay. And I don't know if you're familiar with them. I know the name. Okay. And a little bit more poppy, uh, you know, Amanda and the Marbles. The main place here was uh, Bernie's Distillery. It was downstairs bagel slash punk club. And the owner, Tony, had a record label that he would sometimes put out bands on like one of my other bands tapeworm and the gut bugs uh, fronted by name. tapeworm joe um <laughs> <laughs> uh we we put out a split seven inch on his label with a metal punk band called statutory ape and uh you know they're metal so that i think they got like two songs on their side and we got seven I think six or seven on our, <laughs> on our side of the seven inch, they would make me drink. So I'd be sloppier and use other people's drums, drum sets. So I wouldn't be as precise. And half the songs were just making fun of people we knew. Right. Uh, that sort of thing. But you know, Bernie's, uh, yeah, lots of bands came through there and, <laughs> The Donnas said it was the worst place they ever played. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they hated the stage. The stage was about three inches off the ground. Uh, that sort of place. I, I, I might have shown you some pictures, but it was like a, a staple. Jeffrey Dahmer used to drink there when he went to Ohio State. Uh, That's kind of fucking crazy. Lots of old weird stories. Uh, the fucking bathroom doors were always ripped off and. Sometimes soap suds would be coming up through the four vents and all the people in bands got hired as security when the famous bands came through. Uh, the Queers recorded a live album there called Weekend at Bernie's. Okay, yeah, the Queers used to play here every so often too. Uh, stuff like that. I saw Mindless Self-Indulgence play there because they were bored uh, in between their show at the bigger hall uh, down the street. Uh, they just kind of showed up to play. It was pretty fucking wild. But anyway, um, that is more of the the hallway where the reddish hallway in Hardcore Logo, where there's writing on the wall and stuff like that. I sort of made me think that there is a club in almost every city that looks like that in, in the back area. Uh, it really made me think of Bernie's. It's been a long time since I've been there. It got uh, torn down a couple years ago uh, because it was too close to campus to survive. Uh. And um, anyway, sorry. Uh, we haven't even got to the tour. The tour hasn't started yet. Joe Dick <laughs> Joe Dick said, okay, we got Billy Talent back because you know, he's a stand-up guy. He heard about what I said about Bucky Hate. And he came up for the reunion show, and we're best buds. I'm going to talk him into doing a five-city tour. And now I've never toured in another country, but I have played in almost all the states, continental United States. Uh, so I'm not really sure about right. the drive. Uh, there's decent lengths of driving uh, between Canadian metropolises. But I was looking, and you were talk- talking about driving. And stuff. One of the cool things that I do like about touring from Columbus is 
it's like a nine hours drive to New York, eight hours to Chicago, less less than that, I think, to Pittsburgh. You know, you could just it's like shoot one out. way or round trip. One way. Oh, okay. But our first ever, the first ever tour I did for no help booking from anybody. Just be the guitar player back then on uh, MySpace. You could search area codes or zip codes, zip codes, and genres, and it would just give you all the bands that have had listed themselves on there. Oh, so no shit. I remember we, that we did a lot of booking through there, and we playing so many shows here. Every time an out of town band came through, we tried to either be there or play with them or both so just collecting emails and phone numbers and shit and all that stuff and the but the first yeah the first show we drove over 800 miles for some dumb fucking reason to manchester new hampshire holy shit and that was our first real tour uh not counting you know a weekend up to Chicago and then Indianapolis or something like that. Like the first time we packed up bags, said goodbye to our girlfriends, uh, you know, had a map. There was a lot of map quest involved uh, in the earlier <laughs> oh, times. Quest. I think we oh, had. Fuck. I think we changed the name of one of our tours to the Fuck Map Quest Tour because it got us <laughs> lost so many times. Or going down one way streets in DC. Uh, all sorts of dumb shit that MapQuest did. Um, but, okay, so... The way Joe's got it is we're just we're going to go on this tour, and Billy's like, I'm done, and Joe says, yeah, but I'll talk you out of it. You'll be back. Yeah, you'll be back. The bass player has... Uh, is he a schizophrenic? I don't know or if they ever really implied? say... He, he, take, he takes medication for something. I don't know if he's like... Uh, schizophrenic or like manic depressant or like uh, it's kind of hard to say and they leave it kind of vague he's he does not do well without his medication oh, that's uh, he's he's a very thoughtful probably the nicer nicest person in the band uh, but he does not do well without his medication and the drummer pipe fitter it's like lots of drummers but you know. <laughs> I've definitely known dudes like pipe fitter like a lot of my older brothers, friends that all grew up on like fucking hair metal and shit, remind me a lot of Pipe Fitter. <laughs> yeah, it was a dude that hung out with. What was Guns and Roses before they became Guns and Roses? Something Guns. Uh... When they were more punkish, the like where uh, Izzy and Duff came from. Uh, I can't remember. I was not a big enough fan to know that much about their lore. So yeah, they they get a vehicle. They're supposed to go to what Calgary, Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Edmonton, Edmonton I think. And yeah. they start in Vancouver. I think so. That sounds right to me. Uh, and one thing I have not read the book that this is based on, but I have a I have a copy of the book, but I haven't read it for fucking ten years, so I can't really I couldn't really comment on. How how it's different. I should I should really crack into it. It's not very long. It's like a novella basically, but uh yeah. I don't know, Michael Turner, the author. Uh that I saw that he was a musician and it kinda shows because it's real enough to be real. Uh, uh, the the band dynamics, the shit that happens on the road, the showing up and clubs closed and shit. I don't um one time in I think it was Bristol, Tennessee. The club wasn't closed. We've had clubs closed, but we usually found out before we got there. But one time we got to our show in somewhere, Tennessee, that was not Nashville and it was not Johnson City. Nashville was easy to have a blast in and Johnson City, there was a couple cool punk dudes that really hooked shit up. Uh, and some bands from around here, we would sometimes all link up down there on our tours, or we would go down there and go together, and everybody from the bar would go back to the promoter's house and drink his homemade moonshine, and just go nuts. 
And, um, but anyway, I think it was Bristol, Tennessee. We showed up and the owner of the bar was there and he was the promoter, but he forgot what day it was. <laughs> Very professional. And he had announced that the club was going to be closed so they could get ready for our show the next day. And... <laughs> so what did you end up doing? You know, fortunately, we had the next day off. So we said, yes, we'll play that show. And then he said, you know, you can bring your gear in. And we went, okay. And then he said, you know what? I could probably call a couple people. And I'm in a band. Uh, let's just have a show tonight. And then you can play tomorrow, too. So... Fuck it, we played, uh, we had, I think we did all of our weird shit, shit we were working on, and covers, all all the covers, and just had sort of like a party show. Right. And his band, I think his band was called the Impotent Sea Snakes, <laughs> if, if I remember oh, correctly. I love bad punk names. <laughs> And a friend of our, we usually wore all of our friends' bands t-shirts when we traveled around as much as we could. And uh, this one band called Children of Reagan had a satanic logo on their thing with Ronald Reagan with goat horns. Oh, nice. And this really fucking hammer dude in the, if you think of a dirty NASCAR sweatshirt, you're probably picturing what I'm talking about. (laughs) Got really fixated on it guitar player was wearing it Uh, and he started trying to buy it off of him oh okay yeah it didn't turn out that sort of way it it was very uncomfortable because i was a shirt the satan yeah i I had a lot of i suddenly had a lot of flashbacks to the fucking bad religion uh crossed out cross shirt that i used to have and the fucking looks and the comments that people would hurl at me and i was like 15 when i was wearing this fucking thing and like people were so fucking shitty about it that it's like man it's no wonder like i fucking don't wear shit like that anymore and i like to i much more prefer to blend into the fucking crowd now especially i mean it's it might be different in like a bigger city like in denver i wouldn't be the weird one like that wouldn't be the weirdest craziest shirt you'd see on any given day probably but in small town Wyoming, uh, that sure pissed a lot of people off. I can imagine. It'd be kind of like now if I wore like a fuck Donald Trump shirt, like I would get <laughs> probably harassed by more people than people would be like, yeah, man, fuck yeah. Shot at. Yeah, fuck, you never know, man. They're fucking getting crazier by the day. Uh, yeah, let's fucking let's hurry up and finish talking about hardcore logo because a lot of these stories that you've been uh, well, I totally interrupted your fucking uh, story about the uh, oh the, the the show the show that almost didn't happen the NASCAR fan of Satan yeah uh, yeah yeah so he I forget what he did he just kept pulling out crumpled up monies out of his pockets <laughs> he's like here here is this, is this uh, and eventually it was enough and then he tried to give his shirt. To, I'm trying not to name people either in some of these stories. Uh, you tried, wanted to trade? <laughs> yeah. It's like, and I'll give you his shirt. And it's like, I don't want it. Thanks. No, no, it's a deal's a deal. It's like, I didn't make a deal for the shirt. You bought my shirt. No, no, no. It's, uh, so we, we did eventually drive around with that in the back of the van for a little <laughs> while before it disappeared. <laughs> and somebody brought out an inflatable sex doll. And it, it was a weird thing. And it wasn't just dudes. Uh, <laughs> like, it's sounding right now. And it, it, I mean, it ended up being a good time. We, ended, we went back to the club owner's house. Big fucking party. And I was, I was usually the one that was not single. So I did a lot of guarding the van Um, i think every band has to have at least like one halfway responsible person or else it'll be like if they're all just fucking party animals this is gonna be it's gonna be a disaster from the get-go 
Well, you know, our bass player was usually, he, he was a lightweight. I mean, he would get, he would say he blacked out after a couple Zimas. And, <laughs> right. Uh, the guitar player was responsible, but he was the, the romantic or the, the guy that was usually up late talking to girls and playing the guitar. You know, right. he'd usually bring his acoustic guitar on tour too. So that, that would get busted out at so many after show gatherings and I'd be sleeping on the floor in the back room. And at that, that particular night, some girl came in and was like, come on, fucking pussy. Come party with me. Like, no. So you are a pussy. I'm like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first, uh, I, I started thinking about, I hadn't thought about that in a while, but when I saw uncle Peckerhead. It's. I started thinking about that a little bit because they show up and there's no show, one time. Uh, but then in this part, showing up and the bands arguing in the parking lot, and I mean, there's usually That's... a show here and there where everybody said that it was all set, and then as soon as you get there, it's like, well, we've got to go somewhere else. The cops have come and said uh... we can't have the show here. Yeah, the, the band I hung around had had shows kind of like that. I don't know. I can't remember any times where the show just got flat ass canceled. I remember one time they got booked for a New Year's Eve show at the local fucking Ramada, uh, playing in the bar, and uh, the people that showed up to that fucking bar that night were like all over the age of like, I'd say at least forty five, and just absolutely fucking hated the music that they were playing. And I think eventually went and complained to management and they like shut off their fucking PA halfway into their set and started playing like fucking country music or something like, uh, like on a, on a, on a PA system. Basically that was, that was definitely one of the worst ones. They, they got hardcore booed that night. And like, uh, I think there were some cowboys that just wanted to go dance with their ladies on new year's Eve. And here's these like, you know, early twenties fucking, punkabilly kids like playing just loud angry fucking music <laughs> fucking uh went over like a fart in an elevator um <laughs> but uh so how many how many tours did you do with your band the band you were in i should say the longer than a week or um well i guess yeah maybe we should define like what constitutes as a tour i would say more than uh like uh, I don't know, more five or more shows, I guess, basically kind of constitutes as a tour. I'd probably say something like six or seven, at least. A lot of up into the East Coast, you know, New York, Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh stuff. Um, the right. only time we ever really ventured, aside from going down to Tennessee, sometimes. So we had, we uh, worked on mastering one of our albums in Nashville. But the only time we really, really got exposed to playing in the South was one tour that we did that was it was about a month, a month and a half. I want to say we started out we did two weeks with this band called All or Nothing from California right that we had met the previous tour in Richmond Virginia and then we hooked up we were supposed to play maybe three or four shows together sort of interweaving occasionally but their drummer quit or quit that tour he had to go home and handle some family business. Like something happened to his dad and there was an issue with his wife. Uh. So the, right before we played our show at Bernie's distillery, as I mentioned, um, they, they said, Hey, is there any way that you can just fill in on drums for us for the rest of the tour? Right. And I, I mean, it sounded fun as hell anyway. They were hardcore. I didn't play as much hardcore at that point. But me being me, I just said, yeah, totally. If, because one of the two, one of the parts of the tour, they were going to go play CBGB, and we were going to play somewhere that I don't even remember what it was called in New York, and that wasn't even definite yet. I said, if you can get this band 
on the bill with you as CBGBs, I can definitely say yes right now. And they did it. And so I spent three or four days just, I made a burnt a CD of their set list and just listened to it, did a couple practices with them and then just listened to the CD all the time, all the time. My first show with them was at CBGB's and it was fucking awesome. And that, so I got to play twice in one night there before they closed, which was pretty cool. Um, and I could probably talk about that for the whole, <laughs> whole other that's, that's, rest. The whole of show it. in itself. Yeah. Um, so we did that for yeah about two weeks, and we ended in Chicago, and then we went home. We played this really cool place. I think it was called the Ice House or the Ice Factory. It used to be one of those old school places where they just chopped up chunks of ice, you know, for people and shit. And it right. was turned into a, a club. Uh, that was that tour. I was single and I met a really cool girl. And my bass player was at the end of the show. It's like, no, nope, we're not going back to their house. We have to go home. So he made us drive home that night from Chicago at, you know, what, three o'clock in the morning. So we got back at noonish. <laughs> so he was a big pain in the ass um, but we had already booked the bigger tour so we just sort of went home settled in a little bit repacked bags and stuff like that and left for uh, we started out going south and the bassist left the tour after the second show and went home and he was, he kept saying that he was going to meet up with us later in the tour and he never did. Uh. So a lot of it was just me and the guitar player, uh, playing, playing shows without a bass player. And uh, which is kind of okay. If you're playing punk music, and especially if you're like our bass player is fucking dick. And he left, uh, <laughs> But they robbed our bass player, blew off both of his fucking legs, blew off his legs. We need some money. Please buy our (laughs) shirts. We need to we need to hire a bass player. Please buy our (laughs) CDs. This sucks. Well, it didn't suck. It was it was fun, but it was it wasn't totally full. And that was most of our experience in the South. Right. Um, But a good friend of ours lived in. uh I don't think she lived in Oakland at the time. She lives in Oakland now, but she lived in, had moved to California. So I called her, told her about how everything sucked and she learned our set and played bass for us on all, almost all of our West coast shows. That's cool. And we you know, stayed at her house for ooh, at least a week, week and a half, had a ton of fun. And then, looped back up through the north uh going through idaho and could not get a show in wyoming Eh. (laughs) and stuff like that so that was the longest tour sort of a long story short on that but yeah i would say six to eight times of things that were more than more than five shows uh one time we did technically have a roadie who most of the time just get like drunk and we still have to carry all of our shit. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, yeah. I mean, occasionally that, I mean, that was also part of, you know, being, being like the, the non musically inclined tag along, you know, I run, run the merch booth and help them fucking, you know, load and offload all their fucking gear. And uh, I, I was definitely guilty at least a handful of times of <laughs> fucking not being terribly helpful, but taking full, full advantage of, you know, open bar type of shit. Uh, yeah, I, I was that piece of shit every once in a while. But also, I didn't get fucking paid. I don't think a single time to do any of this. I did it for the fun of it and because they were friends of mine and because I could get into shows for free, uh, which yeah, came, in, came in handy a few times when the rare occasion when a 
you know, somewhat, at least in my, you know, realm of existence, bigger band came, came through town. Uh, our, 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 our place was called the underground, which was a, which was the basement of a place called club dance West, which was like a fucking dance school basically. And, I don't know how what kind of fucking back alley agreement they must have had with this fucking place to have these kind of shows in the basement. But like, I don't know, I, I saw like a handful of like pretty like gutter mouth used to come through town all the fucking time, like at least once a year. Like, I'm pretty sure I've seen gutter mouth uh, like about eight fucking times in my lifetime because they used to love. I think they did the big snowboard tours, so they'd play a lot in. Uh, like a couple places in Wyoming, uh, you know, you know, quite probably quite a few places in Colorado. Uh, Colorado has like way better drugs than fucking uh, Wyoming does, and always had. That probably had something else to do with it too. But uh, yeah, just a lot of a lot of things about uh, hardcore logo and the stories you've just been telling me kind of drummed up a lot of fucking memories about seeing the shows at the underground. Uh, like I, I saw like Tiger Army back in the day when like their second album came out in that fucking sweaty ass basement, and I, I don't think I've ever seen so many fucking people crammed into such a small ass place. Like I don't know how. Thank God, like the place didn't fucking catch fire at that point because that would have been awful. But uh, yeah, I saw. Uh, I didn't see uh, the other time Tiger Army came through town. They played with TSOL in that fucking shitty little basement. Um, nice. Oh, God, I'm trying to think of, like some of the other bigger bands. It, it'll come back to me. The underground like definitely went away at some point. Like I think uh, more than likely something fucking terrible probably happened down there that like eventually the city had to get involved. It was like, no, you're not doing fucking shows down here anymore. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, like I'm sure like underage drinking and underage drug use was fucking rampant. Like it was just it was like a, a big unsupervised party. And that's like a lot of. uh like like hit, handing like a uh, fucking 15 year old punk like stuff like that is uh kind of a life changing thing like being allowed allowed that fucking uh freedom it, it was nothing like like before that what if like the handful of concerts i went to where like either you're or somebody other you're going with fucking parent has to like drop you off and then come pick you up basically like this was like you know carte blanche to just be little bastards down there and listen to punk rock music and get in the mosh pit for the first cut the first time kind of deal do you do you remember what your first like punk rock show was first real punk rock show like that you went to not necessarily that like you played in and it doesn't have to i mean it could be like all local bands or whatever but like i remember mine pretty distinctly but i'm curious if you like remember what your like first one was or anything anything noteworthy about it it was probably let's see in like rancid and rocket from the crypt and somebody else or it was a Green Day on the Dookie Tour with the Riverdales. Uh, the, these were all around the same time. Then there was uh, going and seeing bands I can't remember uh, at, at like the clubs clubs. But I think the first show I ever played, I was 14 and the cops came. <laughs> it was at a house it was a house show and oh, okay i hid in the closet with uh the beer for some reason i don't know like i would never hide with the incriminating evidence now <laughs> but i totally hid in the closet with a beer and um yeah uh, but about those, those were those were the first ones then there was a whole fuckload you know in massive sequence from 14 to whenever I stopped going to like the pandemic when I really I haven't really been to a show since the pandemic right but yours was uh my first was like a straight up fucking local show uh, I don't, I don't think anybody outside of the fucking Wyoming area played it played on that bill but it was like a pretty impressive like you know like we, I, I had my punk friends that kind of like kept me in the loop on this stuff. And I'm like, okay, this band's good. This band sucks. That dude's a fucking jackass kind of deal. Uh, so, so it was all local bands. It was at a place. I'm trying to think of what the fuck it was called. I think it was called like, 
the locust club or like the butterfly club or something. What it was, was a fucking storage unit, like a humongous one, like, you know, you know, like a good size fucking warehouse, basically, that you would rent to like, you know, store probably like heavy equipment or something. Uh, it reeked like fucking gasoline in there for some <laughs> reason, because I think they probably were storing like equipment in there. Uh, and it was on fucking New Year's Eve and they had this place fucking packed with local kids and like they got a good ways into the show like it was well before fucking midnight or whatever but like more than a few bands had already played and then the fucking cops showed up and they arrested the fucking promoter because he didn't have anywhere near the proper fucking permits to be doing this sort of thing also once again, rampant fucking underage drinking. Like, I just saw kids with fucking... Somebody must have bought all of the underage kids, like, 10 cases of fucking 40s or something, because <laughs> I just saw tons of kids my age. I was probably, I don't know, 13, 14 at this point, I think, and had gone with uh, my friend that played drums in the the Billy band that I later kind of followed around a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, I, I was there with him, and, yeah, we're, like, fucking 13 or 14, I think, and the fucking cops show up. This is my first fucking, like, you know, real true punk. Like, I'd been been to a few concerts or whatever before that. But this is, like, my first, like, true, like, punk rock show, basically. And the cops show up, arrest the promoter for not having permits, underage drinking and shit. I think he got, like, 30 days in jail for this shit. Like, they kind of, uh, uh, they, they were not fucking pleased. And, yeah, they sent everybody home. They're giving kids fucking breathalyzers like at the door, like handing out MIPs to all these fucking poor dumb kids. Uh, thankfully, I don't think I had. I'm pretty sure I hadn't drank anything like or like done any drugs or anything like I was still just barely getting into a lot of that stuff at that age. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we somehow managed to escape unscathed. A friend of ours' mom came and picked up like a fucking van full of us and went and dropped us off. I think I went back to my my drummer friend's house and I just, you know, I just ended up hanging out with him. I was like, well, that was kind of a fucking bust. But yeah, yeah li just looking back on it now is kind of hilarious. I can't believe like I literally <laughs> after that being my first experience, I don't know why the fuck I stuck with this whole scene. But I'm glad I, I'm kind of glad I did. Yeah, a lot, a lot of cool people in there, and some a lot of fun shows. <laughs> uh, some more came to mind. Uh, in high school, I saw like the Luna Chicks and the Buzzcocks play oh. with um, shit. What were they called? One Man Army at uh, Al Rosa, uh, the bar famous for where Dimebag was killed. Oh, okay, uh, that's uh, that's outside the city here, and. Uh, Luna, Luna Chicks and Mindless Self Indulgence, Santa Bernie's. Um, yeah, the New Bomb Turks were always playing. I'm, what was some other band? There was uh, actually the guy that did my leg tattoo, Joey Knuckles, owns a tattoo shop in town now, but he was in a band called Knuckle Buster. Uh, I remember that was the first frightening mosh pit I was ever around. Because it was hardcore fucking skate punk. And... Was this the early ages of the kids doing, like, the fucking karate kicks and the windmills and shit, kind of? Yeah, there was definitely some of that. I feel like the most brutal mosh pit I ever was in was actually, talking about sort of poppier shit, was at a Green Day show. A dude got his leg broken. But, yeah, uh, usually, like, especially at Bernie's, they, everybody was really cool about, oh, you do not want to be in this? Let's keep you safe and out of here. And there right. mostly be everybody, for the most part, people were cool. I did find an article somebody wrote about this anti-racist action show we played once. And everybody wasn't very nice to the couple Nazis that showed up. But oh, well, were, like you do, you know, like, <laughs> like you, you do. should do. Uh, but that was, that was more of the home. I mean, the other places there was little brothers and stashes was around for a while, but they went away. I think first, that's like where Nirvana played when they came through before they got famous, that sort of thing. Right. And the sort of middle, middle shows go to like the Newport. And that was where saw like green day and rancid and, 
Bad Religion and other more famous bands that came through and but sometimes a local band would be the opening act and yeah see yeah. i I'd, i did travel to fucking denver before i really got to start like every once in a blue moon we'd get a really you know relatively well-known band like you know gutter mouth or fucking tiger army or whatever to come through casper but uh, yeah, for the most part, I had to kind of wait until we were a little bit more closer to adult age and go to fucking Denver for shows, which, uh, Denver's got uh, some pretty great music scenes. I don't know. We, for the most part, we, we went to a lot of like the bigger stuff, you know, I've seen, uh, I've seen Primus like about fucking 12 times in Colorado somehow, just because if somebody says, Hey, we're going to Primus, you want to go? I'm like, all right, fuck it. Yeah, sure. Uh, they're, they're kind of those bands that I never, never get tired of, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I, my, my taste in music definitely, I feel like expanded real big time in my early twenties. And I started getting into like a lot more, uh, like, uh, definitely metal music was going through like a huge transformation in my early twenties. We started getting like a lot more of the, uh, like screamo fucking death core kind of bands. And like, I mean, even like, even like punk music, I think really like the the California Epitaph Records, Fat Records, kind of like skate punk, you know, your bad religions and your no effects. This is uh, we're starting to I, I don't know necessarily like become less popular or whatever, but like it seems like a lot of the shift in like, you know, some of the newer indie bands. I was really big into a band called the Blood Brothers in my early 20s, which are basically a punk band, although they literally had like real fucking screamy kind of vocals. Uh, but like, yeah, just lots of weird shit going on in different music scenes in my early 20s. So I, I didn't really, I wouldn't say like I lost focus on punk music. I think I just like started listening to a lot of other shit. In the meantime, you know, and eventually, like, I, you know, kind of land on, uh, I really like indus- industrial music and electronic music and, you know, fucking no wave type of shit. That kind of, that brings us to the present, sort of. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll always definitely appreciate those early days of the fucking, uh, the, the punk rock scenes. A- after the underground shit the bed, uh, there were some other new, I mean, there, there's always been like a decent, amount of people trying to get shows to like, you know, happen in this town. Uh, we knew a couple of chicks that were uranium geologists for a little while. Uh, well, I mean, they, they, we knew them for a while. I should say, I don't, I don't fucking talk to these people anymore. I'm sure they're probably still uranium geologists, even though the price of uranium has been in the fucking shitter for a good 10 years now. Uh, but they, they, so they were flush with fucking cash. Cause this was back in the day where like, uh, you know, if you, you could go out and find fucking uranium for these, you know, these companies to dig up or whatever, like it, uh, paid lots and lots of fucking money. So they had the money to blow, you know, five grand or whatever to get a band to come and fucking secure like a crappy little venue. Uh, let's lots of shows at our local American Legion. <laughs> like I saw fucking, uh, like agent orange and the coffin cats a couple times. Um, they used to, yeah, they, there used to be a lot, yeah, a lot of fucking like emo kind of bands that like played in there too that I wasn't so much interested in. Uh, I, saw, I saw the Quakes, another great Psycho Billy band in there. Um, but yeah, we were kind of friends with these two chicks, and they would always put the the my friends Billy band on the bills, especially you know when the the Coffin Cats would come and make their yearly appearance for like a few years in a row. There, they 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 would you know be the one other Billy band around that they could put on the fucking bill basically. Um, but yeah, like they, I mean, it's like, it's like, any, it's like anything else. I think they got tired of losing fucking money on these shows when nobody would show up basically like, you know, in this town, uh, me and, you know, 25 of my friends maybe would be like, all right, the fucking quakes are coming to town. I can't wait to fucking go check that out. Nobody else would show up and they'd lose a fuck load of money. <laughs> Uh, so, so they eventually quit doing that stuff, but, uh, I'll always remember the story they told about when the coffin cats came to town. Uh, they're kind of like a, you know, uh, like a Gothic punk psychobilly band, basically. Um, they, they made, uh, so yeah, the, the one chick I, I, and I actually like got drunk at some point and spent the night on this chick's couch 
uh, she, she, she was hosting the, the coffin cats. They didn't get like a fucking hotel or anything, but, uh, she basically had like the, the flop house for the fucking bands to come hang out with. She made them a massive fucking pot of chili. I remember, which, uh, I don't think they ate very much of for whatever reason. I think maybe a couple of them might've been vegan, might've been the thing with that or something, but, well, uh, they were on tour. Yeah. That, you, well, yeah. Ch- <laughs> I don't know if chili, I would eat chili, chili on might not tour. Be such a good idea. That's a good point. <laughs> if I had a couple days. That's a very had, good point. Yeah, if I had a day off or something, but I, at the very least, you're going to be hot boxing the tour van, <laughs> <laughs> and not not in the fun way. Yeah, uh, yeah, that might that might explain that. That was that was probably a fuck up on her move. She was showed made him something a little a little lighter, but. Uh, I, I guess like the she was expecting it to like be this cool thing, kind of like the chicken hardcore logo, you know, hosting the bands and, you know, you get to like hang out with them a little bit. I don't think they wanted to have anything to fucking do with her. Uh, they the, uh, apparently what they did the for the most time, most of the time while they were there that night is they went through her fucking CD collection and burnt as many CDs as they could get to go on this dude's fucking, you know, old school MacBook or whatever. <laughs> His like mini ba- disc player. Yeah, yeah. Just ba- basically just ripping off all of her fucking music and then being like, well, see ya. And then I don't, yeah, I don't think they ever came back after that. If they did, they probably didn't stay with this chick, which is surprising because, like, I, you know, I, I don't know what the Coffin Cat's marital status or whatever it was, but this chick was pretty good looking. I had a little bit of a fucking crush on her back in the day. I, I'm not too proud to admit. And uh, I, she was a little bit older than me, I think was part of the problem. And I was just kind of a piece of shit in my early 20s for the most part so i don't really blame her for not wanting to have anything to do with me but uh yeah i don't know there's that whole thing which they do touch on in hardcore logo like the uh like i don't know the character's name is mary uh she pops up at one of the later tour oh, in saskatoon t- yeah in saskatoon and she's basically I, I don't know if they necessarily kind of imply it, but like she's basically like kind of a hang around of the band from back in the day. They don't come right out and call her like a fucking groupie or anything. There are other characters in this movie that are absolutely groupies and like are, you know, just basically just want to fuck the band and like the band recognizes that and, you know, is, you know, pretty cool with that from the seams of it until they fucking steal the band's money <laughs> and fuck off in the middle of the night. Billy, or when Joey gets uh, robbed, where did he get robbed? That also in Saskatoon. Okay, yeah, some yeah. Mary, Mary's kind of a different kind of character. Like she is, you know, you know she, now she, she's. Uh, they definitely imply the hardcore logo has been around since like the fucking eighties or whatever. I, I, I'm sure we said this at some point, but they're a fictional band. They don't actually exist. Uh, but it's implied that they've been around forever and are like a fairly well-known, you know, kind of hardcore punk band. And like, yeah, I think Mary is one of the more interesting, like kind of side characters that come across because uh, they still kind of look at her as like the, you know, chick that likes to hang around the band and, you know, you might be able to get into her pants kind of deal. But when she shows up in the movie, she's like, you know, considerably older and she has a kid with her at the show and her husband who, doesn't seem real thrilled about fucking any of this and kind of <laughs> got drug along or whatever. And is like, all right, whatever, go be, go be a free spirit with your punk rock friends or whatever. But, so uh, and yeah, back the, in the day. Yeah. He thinks I'm sure he's been led to believe that that's kind of more what this is going to be about. And of course, like Joe Dick and Billy Talon are like, you know, they don't, they, they still see the old Mary that was, you know, probably, not hard for them to get into her pants kind of deal. And she's just not that person anymore. And yeah, it, it, it reminds me a lot of, uh, when I saw the Lillingtons at a VFW in rock Springs, Wyoming, which is a notorious fucking tweaker town, but also has three strip clubs. Uh, they played a show at the VFW where they didn't serve beer and like, the only people wa- the only people in a mosh pit were under the age of like eight or five. <laughs> it's just like all old fucking middle aged punks and their fucking little tiny kids at the show. And I was just like, oh my god, what the fuck happened to me? When did I reach this age? And like, obviously, a lot of these people are you know a smidge older than me, but not by that much. I was like, huh, 
Well, that was interesting. That was probably the least exciting punk show I've ever been to, but I got to see the Lullington, so I can't complain too much. But um, yeah, Mary, she's she's an interesting character in Hardcore Logo. Yeah, she she got her shit together. She is she is in the now, and the guys are on a memory trip. Yep, they're living in the past. And it is weird when bands reunite. It's the you know I've had I've done a couple reunion uh, things actually that Tapeworm and the Gutbugs band uh, one of the last shows at Bernie's before they close every year there was a thing called Underground Fest right. and it was usually three days of just shows all day mostly through the night and stuff like that uh, so we got together with the bass player from Little Orphan Anarchy. <laughs> That's a great fucking name. <laughs> had had joined the Gut Bugs uh, pretty early on. I, I'm, he, I'm pretty sure he was on the record that we did. But not with the other guitar player. It was just him, me, and uh, Tapeworm. And we were fucking just getting ready, practicing. And, uh, there were... A handful of punk punk houses that did shows and everybody lived together. Uh, this was at one that doesn't exist anymore. I think the only one that's still around. I'm sure there are others, and I'm just too old to know about them. But uh, the the play there was a place on uh, right off campus. I guess sort of surrounded by the frat houses uh, called the Legion of Doom, and it was like not all of them, but the basic veneer of the place was punk house that does shows run by straight edge vegans. And so, huh. you know, you'd be drinking in the van out back. Cause they were just like, we're doing all ages here. We don't do drugs. Just don't bring them in the house. This is a house of God. <laughs> and <laughs> they, they had fun, a lot of really cool shows in their basement. All their Halloween shows was either bands dressing up like other bands and playing their songs either famous or local <laughs> bands. That's right. usually how that went. Um, so, but yeah, we did all this practicing, all this practicing. And then we went to play the show and the bass player didn't show up and nobody could get a hold of him. Nobody found him. I actually didn't see him for two years. And then I ran into him at punk and Drublick or camp anarchy. I forget which one it was called, but that music festival that no effects threw in Ohio. Right. And I just like, ran into him there and I still couldn't get a, any sort of answers out of him, but he did say sorry. And, uh, that, that was a weird thing. I saw a lot of people at, at those ones that you didn't see that often. And yeah, he just popped up. There he was still living his, living his life. Uh, but yeah, that was, that's one way that a reunion can go. Uh, I've definitely, been asked a couple times about that other band that's in most of the most of the stories about doing random reunion shows but it's yeah it's, it's usually difficult unfortunately they were all able to do it for almost five shows in hardcore logo uh mary yeah. is before they have the day off because the club in winnipeg was closed so they go to bucky hates house and do acid and sort of have that next stage of realization about each other in the band, as can happen when you spend a night doing acid together. And, you know, Bucky Hate speaks his truths and takes people to school. I'll leave some of that surprise out for the people that uh, haven't seen it. I don't know why we do this, because we always spoil everything all the time anyway. Right. So, well, let's just say Joe Dick was a fucking liar about what happened to Bucky, and he was just using it to get everybody together to do this show so he could convince Billy to keep the band together. Because, yeah. you know, people will do desperate things when they miss a friend or miss a band. And, like, with this, they talk about the whole band being a family thing after 
they fuck fuck over Oxenberger and sort of push him over the edge of mental health. Uh, yeah, I I can't remember if it's ever implied that they that they did they steal his fucking medication or does he just legitimately lose it somewhere? I can't like I I kind of always remember that like they maybe. Uh, yeah, like take his medication and fucking flush it or something to fuck with him. But like, I I couldn't remember that on this rewatch. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't notice either. Uh, Doug, if you are listening, <laughs> fill us in, Doug. Fill us in. It might be uh, something that's in the book too, where they're like, "Oh, by the way, we fucking took his stash of fucking pills just to fuck with him," and didn't realize that like, oh, he probably really needs those. That would be cool if it was done so slyly that it's something you don't notice until the third or fourth or fifth watch of the movie and there's i don't know pipe fitter giggling looking like a weird vince neal and or i don't think billy or i don't think billy would have done it i don't think joe would have done it i think if joe did it it was to use the drugs um but he he wanted the tour to go well and Billy was mostly acting relatively professional throughout. He had his angry drunk moments when things were on the outs with Jennifer or Jennifer. I, I, I kind of think that's the same scene, actually, where um, uh, John, the bass player, is looking for his fucking pills. We can also see Billy out on the balcony and you see him throw a fucking phone off of the fucking balcony because I'm pretty sure he just got the call that like he's he's out from jennifer and that's kind of like he he's he's his character is very back and forth in this movie like in regards to uh what he wants to do like he i mean you can tell he wants to go make the money and be the big fucking rock star or whatever but when that falls through you know he wants to uh you know like basically the dudes in hardcore logo are the only ones that really got his back and he kind of feels like uh, you know, they're, they're like his second best, basically. But then, yeah, if at some point it does come back around that like he's going to be in fucking Jennifer and he kind of turns into a Benedict, Benedict Arnold as far as uh, Joe Dick is concerned. But um, so, yeah, I, I think Billy Todd's got like definitely kind of one of the more interesting character arcs out of all of them. They, they all definitely uh, I mean, like Joe Dick's character doesn't really he, his his character arc is fairly flat because that's just kind of who he is like he knows what he wants he wants to you know keep keep doing the same shit that he's been doing for decades as hardcore logo i think there's a line at some point where he's like they they ask him what he's been doing since hardcore logo last played a show which <clears throat> i think is kind of implied it's been like years or whatever and he's like oh you know i play I, you know I play, I play the joe dick show like you know a couple acoustic sets or whatever like he's a solo actor or something and uh, it, it, that kind of reminded me of like Michael Graves doing his fucking solo shit, which I know a lot of people love. Uh, fuck Michael Graves and his fucking shitty politics. Um, it, that kind of bums me out because yeah, like uh, Graves era Misfits was, I think, like relatively new by the time like I even knew who the fucking Misfits were, and kind of became aware of them and. You know, you, you, I, I think a lot of people my age kind of went backwards as far as that goes. Like you start off on the stuff like Famous Monsters and like that stuff. And then you go back to the Danzig shit. And you're like, oh, fuck, all this Danzig stuff and Danzig and Samhain and all this shit. Uh, but that, that's kind of what that, that line kind of reminded me of. There's so much like I, I'm glad you bring up the rewatchability of Hardcore Logo because there's so much fucking shit going on in this movie. It's it's very much like an Altman movie or like uh, Return of the Living Dead reminds me of this a lot where like the dialogue is fairly quick and lots of like really naturalistic, like stepping on each other's lines kind of shit. Uh, there's also just like so many just like subtle like this isn't like I, I hesitate to call this a comedy at all. Uh, because like the humor in this is extremely subtle and like, it's not really a movie that's going for laughs. Like this is really just like kind of a, a faux documentary. That's, you know, just like a character study basically of this band of fucking weirdos that all come with their own baggage and their own, own shit basically. Um, but like, yeah, so much of it reminds me of fucking hanging around and fucking, uh, you know, watching bad punk bands or, or good punk bands, uh, and like, yeah, just the, the kind of people I used to know. And so some of them, some of them I still know, 
So some people didn't live to like escape the fucking punk rock scene. Like uh, uh, at least a few people I know, like the uh, you know oxycotton was like starting to be like a really big thing. I think well, around the time I was in fucking high school. So uh, stuff like that happens. Lots of people fucking drank themselves to death. I mean, I, I also live in Wyoming where fucking suicide is fucking rampant. So uh, the the lucky ones basically grew up to be squares and had fucking kids and kind of settled out or whatever. The not so lucky ones didn't live to fucking see 30 kind of deal. And that's, that's kind of just the way, you know, I, that's, that's not unique to punk rock. That's just kind of a way of life kind of deal. But, um, like, yeah, like the doornails song by no effects that you brought up earlier. Well, you didn't bring up the song, but I don't know if you heard their song doornails. Uh, I believe so. Is that one of the newer stuff? I th- they might have a whole new album that I have not heard yet, and I'm <laughs> kind of confused. Uh, it it is probably in the newer. It was after War on Errorism. Okay. And it might have been after what Wolves and Wolves Clothing. Okay. I think after that it was Coaster. Right. Uh, it might be on. I think it's on one of those. And then they've got self-entitled and they did another live album. And then they did a more hardcore type album and some other things here and there. And uh, Fat Mike has the whole Koki the Clown side persona. Right. But yeah, I think we're relatively, unless we're going to totally talk about the ending of this movie, which we don't really need to. It is shocking. Especially the first time through, especially when you're shit faced and somebody told you that it was. A <laughs> uh, well, I mean, <laughs> this was probably a lot more believable as like something that like could, you know, could be real back in the fucking late nineties when it came out. Definitely by like nowadays. I mean, we've seen enough uh, stuff that looks like an episode of The Office, as I like to call it. Uh, that you know, I mean, it's obviously a fucking movie, but um, I, I, I still, I mean. I think we could talk about the ending without really saying what happens basically. And like, you know, people have seen this will know what we're talking about and people that haven't maybe won't. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's an appropriate ending to this movie. I don't really know. Like, I, I almost think it would have been a sadder ending if they were just like, well, see you later. I'm going to go work at a fucking bank or something. I guess hardcore logos fucking over. I mean, I, it basically is, but like, uh, you know, <laughs> how they get to that point is uh, pretty insanely shocking, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's kind of an appropriate, like very kind of punk rock feeling ending to this. It's, it's extremely nihilistic and uh, offers absolutely zero hope, <laughs> which is uh, what a lot of punk music is kind of about. Uh, they, I mean, they had good music. I liked their songs, hardcore logo. I forget who did them for real. That was one thing I did notice this time around is that uh, Pipe Fitter looked like he knew how to play the drums, but it didn't look like he was always playing the song. Right. Yeah, sometimes it's obvious that the people have no idea to how to play the instruments or it's not really important to them. Uh, but I feel like later on in the tour, as can happen, because espe- you know, especially if you do a longer tour, you're playing all you're playing this almost sometimes you'll switch it up here and there, but you know, you're playing a lot of the same songs over and over and over and over again. So you, you do get a lot tighter because it's a lot of, a lot of practice basically. And, um, so it, it did seem like the actors were closer to playing their instruments by the end of the tour. than they look. Yeah. Like Bucky hate. It- they definitely have the kind of mannerisms about them that made me think that like they probably uh, if they didn't actually know how to play their fucking the actors didn't know how to play their instruments. I think they studied enough uh, other people that, you know, played the instruments that they did like, uh, you know, yeah, like, like you said, uh, Pipe Fitter has his whole look like definitely screams fucking hair metal to me or, you know, like early like you know thrash punk kind of kind of deal and i i think his deal is unfortunately like i think he they they caught him doing fun things in shots where it doesn't match up with the fucking music at all and doesn't really look like he's actually playing everybody else i think does a little bit better job of that 
Um, like definitely Joe Dick has like the leading man. Like he's not always, he's not always playing guitar cause he's focusing on kind of the vocals and like, we'll play guitar when need be kind of, uh, Billy talent is definitely like the fucking grunge guy. Like, uh, he's, he, you know, he plays his guitar. He's got his head down. He doesn't really do a lot of vocals. He's always got a cigarette in his mouth kind of. And like, he does like a lot of the, you know, hunch, especially in the, the like later parts of the tour where he's super fucking drunk and playing the shows. And he's just kind of like, you know, slopping around. It's definitely got like, it, it reminds me of the grunge era a lot, basically. And then, uh, John, the bass player, uh, I don't really know what he reminds me of. He's very like, he's the like calm one in the band for the most part, unless, you know, that he's like poked and prodded a little bit too much minus his medication. And then he kind of loses his shit. But like on stage, he's very uh, like stoic and, you know, reserved basically while the rest of the band is kind of just going ape shit, which seems like a very bass player kind of way to go about it. Basically, um, uh, does that make sense? <laughs> Do you know what you know what I'm talking about? Kind of with bass players a lot of the time. Most of my experience, my bass players weren't the calmest people, but one of them was relatively the more normal. He was he was always stressed out. Everything was always bothered him, and he didn't like to be uncomfortable. He he didn't like to sleep in the van he didn't like to sleep on floors and that's probably why he never came back on that really long tour to be honest but he wasn't doing a lot of drugs and doing dumb shit or starting fights with people he did kind of have a mouth but he would usually be like, dude dude just joking dude and then the other bass player i played with the most he was more I mean, he was really chill, but, like, everybody knew that if shit went down and he was mad, you were fucked. Like, that sort, right. of, that sort of thing. Yeah, you know, he's, he's a really great dude, smart dude. Uh, learned a lot of leftist uh, literature from him and, you know, stand-up dude. He stepped in on the day <laughs> of my wedding. When the guy from uh, Little Orphan Anarchy that I don't get along with, uh, not the bass player that I was talking about, a different guy, uh, called me on the morning of my wedding saying that he forgot and that he wasn't going to be able to do it. Uh. So fortunately, my dude, who it made a better memory anyway, he was ordained already. And he said, I'll do it. So in in the pictures for my wedding, he's a dude standing up there with me. Good okay. dude. Um, I don't think I've ever really been the calm, reserved person in the band. I'm the gremlin <laughs> that like if you just if I got too fucked up, then it's just everybody's having a bad time until you get me locked in the van, and <laughs> I would go more wild. And you're the obnoxious drunk. Yeah, a lot of the times I would try to ghost. And just be like, I, I need to go to the van and watch watch movies. I think it, it'll go bad if I stay around. Right. Uh, the the obnoxious drunk in our band. <laughs> I don't know where he is nowadays. He was uh, maybe the first rhythm guitar player that I ever had. Yeah, a lot. I've been in a lot of three pieces. Right. Uh, he he was a rhythm guitar player, a lot of issues, uh, drank all the time, very Sid vicious -y, like, hurt, uh. cut, not like, hey, everybody look at me, but you just sort of look, and he had set his arm on fire with his bottle of clear liquor, or... Jumped out a window because somebody said he probably wouldn't do it. And, ah. you know, pulling out knives. And it got to the point where he would be so shit faced at shows he'd be playing the wrong songs. And then we would take turns stealing his drinks and, <laughs> and stuff, just try, oh, trying man. to get through the shows. And then he'd threaten us. <laughs> 
when we kicked him out of the band, he mooned us and fell off the porch. At the, <laughs> uh, that, that sort of shit. And uh, didn't see him. Another person didn't see for a really long time. And then he just sort of popped up at Warp Tour with a pocket full of change and gave it to the guitar players. Like, hey, man, I owe you a lot of money. Here's some of it. And <laughs> then he, I really think the last I heard, he was a beekeeper out in the country somewhere. Huh. So if if he's still alive, his life is good. Uh, but for a really long, I've, I th- yeah, for a while there, it was just holy shit, man. I'm surprised you're not dead, sort of stuff. But yeah, I was often watching the merch table and registering people to vote, and I would, especially at least on tour, usually it would be like, oh, okay, we're gonna do a really long drive. And I'm not driving. I'm gonna get fucked up. Right. And just be drunk in the van, and not very often my, uh, you know, my my intoxicant of choice is illegal in a lot of states, <laughs> and in the states where they really look two or three times at people with spiky hair and uh, weird shit on their shirts, it just usually was not worth the risk especially yeah. when i was almost always the only person so there was definitely d- dumping shit out the windows driving through texas and it um got some stuff in california because a uh, band left some stuff at my friend's house and took that and it really helped like when we were in Salt Lake City on the biggest Mormon holiday of the year, Pioneer Day. Uh, <laughs> but all the punks there through through big barbecue shows on Pioneer Day. But right. like they say at SLC Punk, for real, you can't get good booze there. So we had brought uh, cheap cheap wine from California and some other things. And we were kings of the party. And... I don't how how did I get oh talking about people in bands and their their personalities. I, I would say the most responsible one was always our guitar player. Just every once in a while. It was like, oh there's this girl, so we're gonna go to her house and we're gonna keep coming back to this town that shows kinda suck here, but there's this girl here. Uh, stuff like that. So it wasn't. It was pretty typical of person in a band traveling to see person they like to hang out with. I know I spent a decent amount of time over a period going back to see that girl I met in Chicago. Right. And stuff. And I think I think I like had a girlfriend for a day in Arizona. <laughs> and uh, it was like, yeah, we're gonna make it work. And yeah. Uh, not but it, it, <laughs> for real most of the time i was the dude like calling my girlfriend or just not doing anything because of my girlfriend back home one of them moved out while we were on tour like you guys had a place together and she just fucked off while you were gone yeah well it, she and me and the guitar player all had an apartment and yeah ah. she she left she was basically like, welcome back. Bye. Uh, um, but whatever. I could probably, there's so many weird fucking stories, like almost getting beat up by a guy in a band called general Patton and his privates. <laughs> uh, Cause his girlfriend kept talking to me really, really close. Some people get very aggressive. Uh, and right. Territorial. So yeah, I don't know. I wasn't really like pipe fitter. Well, I mean, I'm like me. I'm, I'm pretty much the same, except for I do less now. You know, right. if I drink too much, it's Gremlin Darren. But if I get to choose, I'll just get really stoned, and everybody has a great time. Still trying to register people to vote, even though it's getting <laughs> made more illegal in different states. Fucking hardcore logo, man. 
Yeah, this is a great movie. And we, yeah, in the last hour and 50 minutes, we, we did exactly what I thought we were going to. We barely talked about the movie and just the fucking told, told old war stories, which I think is, you know, probably more entertaining. People should just really just go fucking. Uh, I don't know where the fuck this movie is streaming, if it's streaming anywhere. But like I said, the Blu-ray of this is like 13 bucks. It is well worth your fucking dollars. If if you're listening to this and you've made it this far into the recording, like there's no reason you shouldn't own this movie in your collection and check it out. Uh, it's 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 a fucking uh, a, a brilliant little fucking like movie. Like it's uh, like movies about punks are like so fucking far and few between that like. Uh, this was a really important movie to me now, like back in the fucking early 2000s around the time I discovered it kind of because there wasn't really a lot of other like you could count on a, both your hands. Probably all the movies were like punks even making appearance, let alone a whole movie about fucking punks or punk culture kind of deal. I mean, now nowadays we're a little bit more spoiled and we've, you know, got a few other things like I, I fucking adore Green Room, I think is like what it is probably like the, you know top three movies about fucking punk culture and really like only a small chunk of that movie has anything to do with that. And then it turns into kind of a fucking horror movie basically. Um, but, uh, yeah, the other, other great punk movies, repo man was a really important one too. I, I think I discovered that a little bit before hardcore logo came around and that's got, you know, a great punk rock soundtrack and just a lot of, a lot of punkisms, I guess, you know, <laughs> like fucking <laughs> uh, like his buddy that wants to work is like a fry cooker or whatever. And Otto's just like fucking that sounds fucking lame. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the Repo Man is definitely, I think, like probably the king of the fucking punk movies and uh, just has a very punk feel to it. Uh, I, I, I guess like other notable stuff would be like Return of the Living Dead. Uh, which is not really like a punk movie. I, well, I don't know. It's kind of a punk rock zombie movie. It it has a lot of uh, a lot of other punkisms, and our main characters, for the most part, are all kind of punks. So uh, lots lots of great dialogue and like quotable shit that has appeared in like a bazillion fucking uh, low low budget like horror punk fucking albums <laughs> over the years. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I mean, what, am, what am I forgetting? Is it, this is, this is your problem. Which one? Suburbia. I, oh, see, that's one I, I don't think I've seen. And oh, I've... Uh, Fleas in it. Uh, one of the guys from Platoon is in it. Uh, it's about these punks that live in a squat. And they go to shows. And I think the Vandals are playing at all of the shows that they always go to. And there's kids banding together and course they're they uh it's it's a little bit of a heavier movie but it's it's yeah squatter punk kids fleas one of them he's got a pet rat in the movie uh yeah there's the girl who was abused by her father there's the rich kid that's like fuck you all i'm gonna hang out with my friends and things don't necessarily end well for most people in that movie uh rock and roll high school has got to be oh yeah that's yeah that's Um, another one Newer, there's uh, Uncle, <coughs> Uncle Peckerhead. I haven't seen that one yet. I, you mentioned that earlier in the show. And I was, I had, to, I had to think for a minute. I was like, oh yeah, that's a movie. That's uh, I was thinking it was a band for a minute, but no, yeah. it's yeah, un- Uncle Peckerhead. I think the band in that. It's also about a tour. The band in that, I think they're called Duh. And they're <laughs> they're, they're more of a modern. We wear comfortable clothes and we play rock stripped down rock like the earlier type punk but they're i think they make it kind of obvious on the box but a lot of horror movie people like it's it's like a punk rock horror comedy right Uh, that came out i think last year um i mean there's the decline documentaries Oh yeah, those are fucking. Uh, I I I've definitely seen the first one a few times. I don't remember if I've seen the second one, and apparently there's a third one of those. Is there? There is a third one. I think that is. I can't remember who. It's it's the one that's usually watched the least. Of course, there's so many documentaries that that would be another whole other thing. Right. Yeah. You know. Every band, especially in the VHS era, every band seemed to have a documentary or so. 
Did you have a copy of Ten Years of Fucking Up, the the no effects one that they put out, uh, like in the late nineties? Uh, like you could only get on VHS for a really long time. Yep, and I think I found it all on YouTube a couple days ago. Okay, that's a pretty fascinating watch too, because you get to see them when they're like little baby, like those dudes, like just fucking. I think as soon as they turned eighteen, it just became no effects and went out on their shitty little tours that fucking fat mike planned because he was like pretty good with money even like at that young of an age and uh yeah that's a pretty that's a pretty fascinating watch i haven't seen in a really long time i'm gonna have to see if i got my fucking tape of that later around still somewhere or just go watch it on youtube (laughs) there you go Uh, the future is unwritten about joe strummer is another one that i liked a lot the other f word i i like it but it's i don't know if it's for everybody because it's about being punk dads I don't know if you've watched that one. I haven't, but I'm, it sounds interesting because all of my friends have become punk dads now. It's uh, like Lars from Rancid and Fat Mike and Dwayne Peters from the U.S. Bombs. And there are some other guys, too, but uh, about being older than you thought you were going to be and being a dad and being an anti-authoritarian authority. And other shit like that. Uh, that's so, a, that sounds good. I, I definitely recommend that. There's obviously not all happy moments, but a lot of it is pretty cool. But yeah, that's called the other F word. There's this one released about the dwarves that I've heard really good things about. The El Duce tapes. Oh, really? I haven't checked that out. I wonder if... I, I don't know. I don't know when it was made. But we played a show with them once. Really? On New Year's Eve... Are you talking oh, wait, about people it... people drinking? Oh, wait. Huh? I think I might be thinking of the wrong band. Did I say the dwarves? I think it was the yeah. mentors. Oh no, did not play with the mentors. Okay, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's yeah, that's who the El Duce tapes is about. That's not a band I'm super familiar with, but I've heard really good things about the documentary that they put out about it. I'm pretty sure it's the mentors. Who like all, all I really know about them is they played in the fucking Black Hoods, which are very uh uh, uh, reminiscent of a certain clue, cl- a certain clan that starts with a fucking K, shall we say? Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, their their whole bag, like that's like kind of a whole side of punk rock that, like, I don't, you know, I I guess I'm getting older and softer, but like, I definitely don't dig on the uh, we'll do just about anything if it fucking pisses people off kind of attitude of people like Gigi Allen or fucking the Mentors or you know like any. Basically, anybody that thought it was cool even back then to wear fucking swastikas on stage, like, how did you not know that was a fucking not cool thing to do, kind of? Uh, that was never really my style either. Another State of Mind was another one I watched early on. I don't know if you saw that. I don't think so. That one was Youth Brigade, uh, the brothers that run BYO Records. Okay, yeah. Um, Youth Brigade and Social Distortion on possibly their first tour, but really, really early on, they did a tour of Canada and the U.S. in a, I don't want to say fixed up school bus, but a school bus they ripped all the seats out of (laughs) and did some things. Uh, There's a lot (laughs) of having flashes of parts of that that could have been straight out of Hardcore Logo. Yeah, going, right. going to punk houses and stuff like that. But, you know, when they go to D.C., they go to meet Ian MacKay and stuff. And so, yeah, that, that, that was called Another State of Mind. And I think that's when Mike Ness wrote that song. I think he wrote that song on that tour. But he was a little, I, I, he looked like he was 16. <laughs> his hairline went all the way down to his eyebrows practically. Uh, that's, but yeah, lots of documentaries, cool punk fucking movies. We did exactly what we were planning on doing. I think we talked longer than the movie is. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Which is okay. Yeah. Like I said, I, I, I think us talking about just punk stuff in general is probably going to be a little bit more interesting than like, you'll have to wait for Doug Tilly to like actually put out a, put out a podcast about hardcore logo where he like really takes that thing like bit by bit and fucking, cause it's like, it's like I said at the beginning of the show, it's a, it's a movie where there's like all kinds of fucking shit like to, 
take away from it and unpack from it basically it's it's an incredibly like dense movie for being only 90 minutes long or whatever but uh yeah we'll, we'll definitely have to re- revisit this this topic again because there's like yeah like a bazillion other fucking punk movies and punk shit that i could uh see us do it do it and you know little little shows on or whatever uh lots of lot, there's a lot of pretty good books about punk too like i, I think probably one of the better known ones is henry rollins get in the van uh, which there's a great fucking audio book of that floating around. I think there's parts of that on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, if you, if you could ever convince Vanessa to do something like that over on the VD clinic or, um, I don't remember who wrote it, but there was a great one that I read in high school called Dharma punks. That was about a dude that like, I don't remember if he was in a band or if he just hung around a lot of punk rockers, but, uh, he took his like drug and alcohol use, like to some pretty, gnarly extremes and like within the scene or whatever and i think it ended up in jail and discovered buddhism i'm pretty sure oh, and like that's kind of like the the back half of the story is like kind of him you know discovering buddhism and how it like kind of changed his life and how how he still kind of like kept a lot of his ideals from the the punk rock era but it also kind of like helped him get his you know life a little bit more on fucking track kind of deal uh, that's a that's a really inter- interesting read i think it's called dharma punks I cannot remember for the life of me who wrote it, but Noah Levine. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I I haven't read it since high school, but I remember loving it when I did read it back then, and uh, yeah, it's a, that's that's a solid one that's uh, worth checking out, especially if like you got a kid that's like seventeen or eighteen or something. It's like not really like a super like cautionary tale, but like I think uh, like pretty good reading for like that's when you're kind of that in that in between stage where. Uh, a lot of the kids that you know are probably like you know, uh, you, you know, for for first getting into drugs and alcohol, I think kind of, and uh, some of them learn to do it responsibly, and some of them take it way too far and don't live to see fucking thirty. So uh, probably probably a good one to lay on your seventeen, eighteen year old kid that's got a fucking mohawk or whatever, uh, which I, I would imagine is probably a lot less common nowadays than like when you or me were seventeen, eighteen years old roughly i don't know what the kids are doing anymore like that's such a weird thing to me that like there's probably a lot of kids that like just do not give a fucking shit about any of this stuff i remembered why i sort of remembered the thing about dharma punks is a couple years ago that dude did have some allegations oh uh, no him uh being inappropriate with i think students at one of the places or uh, something like that. Uh, I don't know how much it really panned out, but when we were doing uh, either the long time ago Hollywood Sex Pests episode that Doug Tilly was on, right right after Weinstein started going down, or if the more recent Consequence Culture episode when I was looking up bullet points in case I needed to steer the conversation. Right. I th- think that the, I don't remember how it panned out but he didn't say he was totally innocent alright never mind don't go read his book fuck that just go read Get in the Van by Henry Rollins we're pretty I'm pretty fucking sure Henry Rollins is like a true is an actual just like angel <laughs> sent here by the gods so yeah never mind don't fucking go read that other one oh, Jesus Christ I mean, I, I, it's, 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 it's obviously super fucking unfortunate. Like we can't just out these fucking people immediately like they should be. Uh, but like, yeah, I don't know. At least in my, my local music scene, I can't really remember anybody being an obvious fucking sex, sex pest. Definitely, definitely not in the band that I followed around. Like, uh, at least one of those dudes was married through like most of that. Um, uh, well, actually, yeah, the bass player and the the guitar player were both married through a lot of that. The the guitar player was and singer songwriter was like our kind of uh, uh, the 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 straight man. He he went through like a big big straight edge phase where like he barely even fucking drank or anything. Like wouldn't even have like a beer at the shows or anything. Even though like he like I, I was friends with his little brother first that played drums and like I used to yeah when we were like thirteen fourteen fifteen go get stoned it. Uh, the little brother drummer's house uh, after school and shit. And like slowly, eventually, like, yeah, when we were like about 17 or 18, the guitar player was the one that became a huge pothead for a while. 
And we would all hang out in their fucking basement, getting stoned, listening to records and watching stuff like, you know, Repo Man or Dawn of the Dead or whatever. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of like when they would actually get local shows, he was like the uh, the, the the straight and narrow dude. He, he was the one that married the chick from fucking Australia that worked in the head shop that had to fend away the fucking narcs trying to buy fucking cocaine or whatever in a fucking head shop. So, um, yeah, yeah, they, they, they are all, all all very different personalities. Like, uh, I, I can't really pinpoint any of them on like a, a hard. None of them were a character from hardcore logo logo. But at the same time, they all kind of were, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, they, they were good uh, avatars for of musicians because everybody there wouldn't really be a band where everybody was exactly like one of them because that, yeah. that many people like that can't get that thing done so everybody's got their own little part to play yeah man it was good talking with you what uh anything you want to you want to pimp before we say peace um yeah i mean come come if you're not already hopefully you are already but if for some reason you're listening to this and you're not uh come check out the doing the nasty podcast that's a show that duncan and i do uh we're going through all of the tier three because they already did the other fucking tier list of the video nasties on the other two but uh we're talking movies that were banned in the uk or at least like they could be confiscated from your fucking video store or whatever uh, and tier three is all over the place in terms of quality and like how, especially in 2020 eyes like, or 2021 eyes, how actually offensive these movies are and like how fucking hilarious it is that people thought these movies would warp fucking, you know, kids minds and turn them into serial killers or whatever. Uh, we, we've, we've, we've done all kinds of shit so far on the year and a half that we've been working on this show, you know, everything from like Dawn of the Dead and Suspiria and Deep Red and like on the, on the good end of the spectrum. And then we've also done stuff like Jungle Holocaust and fucking Mosquito the Rapist. And that the, was in the last episode I listened to. Yeah, that was a fucking rough watch. That movie is fucking dog shit. Uh, really entertaining show to do. And yeah, mostly for that reason, just because the quality of the movies is all over the place. They were just like, uh, you know, throwing a plate of spaghetti at a fucking wall of video store shit and being like, well, everything that got hit is banned kind of deal uh, is kind of how it, how it felt. But uh, yeah, that's over. Uh, I, I, I think if you just search the podcast under the stairs and go to their website, that's under the kind of subset of shows over there. Uh, there should be, it hasn't come out yet. We're recording this, uh, this here episode towards the end of August, uh, 2021. I think the next episode that's coming out is, uh, extra, the super fucking bizarre British fucking alien ripoff kind of, uh, extra is fucking insane. Like there, uh, there's a pretty, at least right now, there's a pretty good copy of that on YouTube. If you've never seen it. Uh, it's really goddamn weird. Like one of the fucking weirdest movies I've ever seen. Uh, and then the other movie on that episode, cause the movies are picked kind of randomly. We didn't do them in like alphabetical order. I think Duncan just plugged all, I think there's 84 movies on the tier two list. He just plugged them into a fucking randomizer and they come out. Sometimes there's really fun, like through threads kind of deals on, some of these movies were like, wow, these two movies have nothing to do with each other. Actually, oddly, have a lot in common. Uh, so, yeah, next up is Extro and a movie called The Aftermath, which is a post-apocalyptic thing uh, starring a pretty young Sid Haig. Uh, I think it, was, it came out in like 1982 or something. Uh, I have no fucking idea why this movie was banned. It's got a couple like kind of um, like very Tom Savini-esque uh, like head explosions and like bloodshot, you know, people getting shot kind of deal. Uh, and S Sid Haig definitely attempts to uh, have his way forcefully with a few women in this movie, but it's done real like not. Uh, th this is no like irreversible. It's it's, it's done with like eight, what I would call like eighties kids gloves, basically. Like uh, definitely in twenty twenty eyes. Like I I think that's actually one that maybe is a little more offensive in twenty twenty one than it probably was in uh, nineteen eighty fucking two when it came out. And you know a ten year old could go in and rent this thing and not really 
get you know why that's so fucked up kind of deal but anyway uh yeah doing nasty is the name of the show i got a bunch of fucking guest spots uh either coming out or about to come out hopefully i'll be popping up over on desmond's desmond flicks i think is the name of his youtube channel he also does like patreon shows where it's just an audio only thing and then like later on that comes out on uh, YouTube. I'm going to be on one of those. Uh, the nice folks over at Kiss the Goat have invited me to come back on a show, which I'm really fucking excited about. Nice. Because I like barely got to talk to those guys for a couple of years there when they kind of vanished off of uh, social media and were doing their own thing, kind of. I'm I'm glad they're back because I, I do love the, the Kiss the Goat for all the all the Satan worshippers in the audience. Um, we got we got those fucking round tables for podcasts under the stairs yet to record here in September. That's going to be uh interesting i got some i i may once i get off the call here i might go fucking try and cram in one more movie because i think i have like <laughs> 10 first time watches for that end of the decade list coming up here that are due on like the fourth or something so i need to get fucking cracking on a few of those but uh yeah i i, I love doing the summer series over on duncan's show that's like uh that's that's some of the most fun shit that i've done in podcasting over the 10 or so years that I've been doing this crazy shit. Um, so yeah, that should be out here pretty soon. I, I, my, my episode, my other episode of the, you know, the ones that go by the year is coming up here pretty soon, which is 2015. I think that's in two weeks or so that should be out. Uh, I, that, that's where you can hear me fucking gush over green room, uh, which is one of my, man, that's going to score real fucking high on my list of, uh, stuff for the decade. Uh, not uh, sort of not to spoil assuming it's one of the ones that goes through for 2015 uh <laughs> nothing to see here folks go away <laughs> that's not as not a huge spoiler for a show that doesn't come out yet but uh anyway um, i think they're putting yeah. out your year and my year in the same week oh no shit yep i think okay. so so i'm i'm on 2014 Okay, yeah, I gotcha. Well, yeah, is he is he doing them two a week or is he only doing them one a week? I forget. He has been doing them one a week, but on his last, the last one I listened to when he was talking about coming up ahead, he, I thought he said coming up here sometime. There's going to be two summer series episodes coming out in the same week. I guess that would make sense. A lot of these earlier shows, like that fucking seven hour long 2012 episode, which I'm still like, I've still got like an hour and a half of that thing to fucking finish that thing. Like, it makes sense to only put out one of those a week because otherwise nobody's ever going to have time to fucking listen to all this shit. But yeah, like my, uh, the, the, the 2015 episode, I think is about four and a half hours long. So that's a little bit more reasonable yeah. to expect people to be able to do two of those in a week. But anyway... He's he's popular enough. Yeah. Somebody who's not popular is me, but you're listening to me, so thank <laughs> you. You know where to find me if you have found me, but uh, there's more Twitter, at Political Movies. I'm mostly, when I'm on Facebook anymore, it's almost only just in the groups, because there's a bunch of old trolls in the rest of Facebook. Uh, I've spent more Facebook time this summer in Facebook jail than I have on actual Facebook. I still got another 19 fucking days on my sentence for calling an anti-vaxxer a plague rat. That apparently got me 30 days bad. Oh, you should have called him a racial slur and you'd have been uh -huh. okay. Well, the same, the same comment thread, I called somebody a human cum stain and they didn't fucking blast me off of there for that. So I don't understand anything anymore. I mean, somebody somebody got dinged in the psychosemantic group saying that they should nuke the filibuster. Oh, Jesus Christ. So I fuck around more on uh, when I'm online and Twitter and Instagram and doctoring photos of people and been listening to more music. And we did Hardcore Logo and this was psychosemantic. Different point of view, but nothing comes today. I don't have much to say, or to confess it was original and new. Yeah, it's sad, but true. Now I'm a businessman, but my business is a mystery. Constructing this invention with lots of spawn to see. It's just a little piece of mystery. Repeating itself through me.
what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Yep. And cover.